I want to say Merry Christmas to all uh, 19 of our other campuses on four different continents. Would you just clap and say Merry Christmas to all of them? God bless you guys. This is the 39th Saddleback Community Christmas Services of the last 39 years. I've done all 39 of them. And this year, Saddleback has grown so much, we're offering 105 Christmas services. Right. Um, I'll be checking into the hospital the day after Christmas. <laughs> Actually, I'm not gonna try to do all of them live. Can't do 104 or five services uh, without using a little bit of video. Uh, but if you're new to Saddleback, inside your program, there's a thing we call message notes. This kind of little cheat sheet, and if you'll pull it out, it's kind of a direction of where we're gonna go in our service this year. You know, I have studied the Christmas story my entire life. I mean, for over 50 years, I've studied the Christmas story. But this year, when I went to begin studying the text of the Bible on the Christmas story, I saw something I've never ever seen before. It was a, it was a new discovery to me. And what I saw was the emphasis on the word time. Using the different translations of scripture, I saw that there are 16 different references to time and timing in the Christmas story. That God had a timetable for Christmas. Now, having the right time, having a sense of timing is important in so many areas of your life. Most of the stress in your life comes from poor timing. Either you're in a hurry, or there's a delay, and both of those things can stress you out, being too fast or too slow. On the other hand, one of the keys to success in life is wise timing. And when you do the right thing at the right time, it just works. On the other hand, can you say the right thing but say it in the wrong time and it's a disaster? Yeah. Can you do the right thing but do it at the wrong time and it's a disaster? Yes. Timing is everything. Timing is the difference between a good joke and a bad joke. <laughs> Comedians have great timing. Uh, timing is the difference between when they pay one baseball player, a professional one, a pitcher, $80 million to throw a ball and they won't pay another guy, an amateur, any money to throw the ball. It's the same two and three quarter inch ball. It's the same number of feet from the pitcher to the batter. The difference is the $80 million guy has a better sense of timing. They're paying him $80 million for timing. The difference between a great leader and a poor leader is not just knowing what to do, but knowing when to do it. The timing is everything. The difference between a speaker who holds your attention and is interesting and a boring one, the difference between those two is timing. Had you there for a minute. Now, what does the birth of Jesus tell us about God time, God's timing in your life? Well, this is really important, so I want you to write down these five truths, great truths about God's timing in your life. It's gonna lower your stress, it's gonna raise your success if you'll understand how to cooperate with God's timing. So let's, let's look at this. Number one, what do we learn from Jesus' birth about God's timing? That God has a timetable, number one, God has a timetable for everything that happens. God has a timetable for everything that happens. This is taught all through the Bible. In Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one, it says this. There's an appointed time for everything and there's a right time for every activity under heaven. It says there's a right time for everything, there's an appointed time. Look up here on the screen. In another translation, today's English version, everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. God has a timetable for everything. And he even had a timetable for Christmas. Look at the next verse, Galatians chapter four in the Bible, verses three to five says this. When the right time came, God sent his son to earth, born of a woman and living under the law, so that his son could pay for our freedom from the law, set us free, and adopt us as his children into God's family. That's what God sent Jesus to do. Show us what God's like, to save us from our sins, to adopt us into God's family. But notice the phrase, when the time was right, 
God sent his son. Christmas happened at just the right time. What made it the right time? We don't know. Why, why 2,000 years ago? We don't know. Why not 2,000 years earlier? I mean, God had been telling the world, I'm gonna send a savior for thousands of years, but he waited a long time before he sent Jesus. Or why not 50 years from this year to send the savior? We don't know why it was the right time, but God says it was the right time to send Jesus. Now that leads me to the second truth, write this down. God does not tell us the details in advance. He has a timetable for your life, but he doesn't tell you the details in advance. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says this, God has given us the desire to know the future, and he always does everything just right and on time, but people can never completely understand what God is doing. Everybody agree with that verse? Yeah, you know, why? Because God is God and you're not. For me to try and understand God's timetable is like an ant trying to understand the internet. I don't have the brain capacity. If you could understand why God does everything God does, you'd be God. Now, he says that God has given us this desire to know the future. Have you noticed all the crazy things people try to do to figure out the future? Tarot cards, palm reading, tea leaves, astrology, all kinds of crazy things trying to figure out the future. But the Bible says God doesn't let us know the timetable. Why? Why didn't God just tell you everything that's gonna happen in your life right up front? Well, I think there are two or three reasons. First, it would overwhelm you, probably scare you to death. You couldn't handle the truth, to quote Jack Nicholson. <laughs> Second is you'd probably abuse it. If you saw everything that was gonna happen in your life, go, I don't like that part, I'm gonna change that, kind of like back to the future. We're gonna change history before it even happens. But the real reason God doesn't announce his timetable to you is he wants you to trust him. He says, just live one day at a time. Trust me, I, I'm a good God, I'm a loving God, everything I do in your life is for, for love, but you just gotta trust me. In Acts chapter one in the Bible, the Bible says this, Jesus said in verse seven, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. Now the subtext of that is, it's none of your business. <laughs> so you're just not ever gonna know stuff in advance. You don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow in your life, much less the rest of your life. God has a timetable for your life, but he doesn't give you the details in advance. Now here's the third thing we learned from Christmas is that God is never in a hurry and he's never late. God is never in a hurry and he's never late. He's always on time, his timing is perfect. Now, the reason for this is because God is on a different wavelength than we are. God has a different view of time because God is timeless. Now, this is kind of hard to understand. God is not bound by time, he's not limited by time. God can be in the past and the present and the future all at the same time. Your view of time, my view of time happens because we happen to live on a planet called Earth that circles 24 hours, every 24 hours it, it rotates and every 365 days it goes around the sun so you have marked your life in 24 hour days and 365 day years. If you lived on Mars or Pluto, your time, concept of time would be very, very different. And, it, and God doesn't live on a planet, so God is timeless. Einstein wrote a lot about this, the space-time continuum, and how, how it, uh, it, it's very different than what we typically think about time. God is never in a hurry, and he's never late. Now let me show you God's understanding of time. Look up here on the screen. Second Peter, the Bible says, chapter three, verse eight. Never forget this. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. Does that sound like the way you treat time? That's the way it feels when I'm waiting for a meal. Okay, it feels like a thousand years sometimes. But no, no, we don't think in those terms. God's timelessness that I'm talking about has big implications for your life. So let's just go back. When, when God created you, he puts a dream in your heart. Most people start off with a dream, what do they wanna do with their life? And they have a vision, a big vision, a big goal. They have uh, you know, some kind of dream or plan or project that they wanna do with their life, their, their vision. What's the vision God has given you? 
Now, I've talked to tens of thousands of people over the years, and I've discovered that while everybody tends to start off early in life with a vision, here's what I'd like to do with my life, here's what I dream of doing, that as life goes on, more and more people give up on the dream before it's accomplished. They give up on the vision, they give up on the goal because it doesn't happen fast enough. Some of you have had your dream battered. Some of you have had your dream bruised. Some of you have had your dream broken. And some of you, out of discouragement and disappointment, have buried your dream. You've given up on it. God doesn't want you to do that. If God gave you that dream for your life, it's gonna happen. It just has to happen in his timetable, not in yours. Let me show you one of the great promises of the Bible. It's this next verse, Habakkuk chapter two, verse three. God says this about your dream, about your vision, the one that he gives you. The vision will happen at the right time that I have appointed. It moves steadily toward the goal. It will not be proven false. If it seems slow or delayed, just wait for it. It will certainly happen. It will not be late. Some of you need to write that Bible verse down on a little three by five card and put it in your visor, on your bathroom mirror, on your windshield or you know, in your, you know, your refrigerator door so you see it every day. To not give up on the dream that God has given you. Because he said it'll happen. If, now if it's your dream, you just made it up. Well, that, God's not obligated to do that. But if it's a dream that God has put in your heart, you go, I know God made me to do this. I know I'm wired to do this. He says, you just need to wait patiently. It will happen. It will not be late. One of the hardest truths that we all have to learn, I've had to learn it a thousand times. We have to actually relearn it over and over and over is this. God's timing is perfect. My timing is imperfect. I always want stuff now. When I started this church 39 years ago, I was 25 years old. When I started this church, I was in a hurry. I just in a hurry to get everything. And God says, no, it's not all gonna happen. Slowly, steadily, the vision will be fulfilled. And one of the things you have to learn is that God is never early in your life. God is never late in your life. God is always on time. It's a big lesson. Now, here's the fourth thing that we learn. Write this down. Is that God's timing, while he has a timing and it will happen at the right time, God's timing is not always convenient. God's plan for your life and God's timing for your life, it's a good plan, it's for your benefit, it's a loving plan, but it doesn't mean it's painless and it doesn't mean that it'll always be easy. No, God's plan is not always convenient. God's timing for your life is always your best, but it's not the easiest. For instance, Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth was not convenient for Mary and Joseph. I mean, think about this. Here's a young couple Jesus is going to have, is going to be born. Mary has not had sex with Joseph. Who's going to believe that story? Would you believe it if your teenage daughter came and said, hi mom, I'm pregnant, uh, I've never had sex, and the baby is God? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but an angel appears to Joseph and goes, she's telling the real story. And then in the middle of all of this, The Caesar of Rome, Caesar Augustus, decides to throw a census. And he says, everybody has to go back to the town that they were born in to be registered for this census of the Roman Empire. Now let's put this in perspective. He's not saying you're gonna get counted wherever you are. If tomorrow the government made a rule that in America, everybody's gonna be in the census, you're gonna be counted, but you have to tomorrow go back to the town you were born in. It would be chaos in America. Everybody trying to go back to the town that they were born in. Every plane, train, automobile would be booked. Every highway would be filled because everybody's trying to go back at the same time for a a census. And so the day before Mary delivers, she's nine months pregnant. Joseph goes, honey, I got to put you on a donkey and we got to take a trip to Bethlehem. Okay, that's not convenient. Those of you ladies who've had babies, 
could probably give us a testimony what it might feel like if you are, the day before you're gonna deliver, gonna take a long journey on the back of a donkey. That wouldn't be convenient. And then when she gets to Bethlehem, she has, she's never had a baby before, she has to deliver her own baby by herself, without her mom, without her aunt, without a midwife, in a barn with a bunch of animals. This is God's plan and time, God's timing because the Bible says Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. It was not convenient, but it was a bigger plan than Joseph and Mary had ever planned for their life and their baby. And it was a better plan. It's not convenient. A lot of stuff God does in your life, but it is bigger and it is better. Everything God has done in my life has been bigger and better than I ever imagined. When I would just trust him in it. So God's timing is not always convenient. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter two, uh, that at that time Caesar Augustus ordered all the people under Roman rule to return to their hometown to register in a census. And so Joseph took Mary with him to Bethlehem and by this time, she's very pregnant. And in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have her baby. None of that was convenient. Now there's a fifth truth that we learn. We learn that God has a timetable for your life, that he doesn't tell you the details in advance, that he's always on time, he's never late, but he's never in a hurry, uh, that it's not always convenient. And then here's the fifth thing. At the right time, God can do anything instantly. At the right time, God can do anything instantly. God can do more in one millisecond than I can do in five, 10, 20 years or my entire life of the wrong timing. At the right time, God can do it instantly. So he doesn't worry about time because he, he doesn't need time to accomplish what he wants to do. In Isaiah 60, verse 22, God says this, I am the Lord, so when the right time comes, I will make it all happen, how? Quickly, circle that, quickly. When the, I'm God, so when it's the right time, I'll make it all happen quickly. Now this is hard for us to accept. The most difficult place for you to be in life is in God's waiting room. In God's waiting room. Some of you are in God's waiting room right now. What is God's waiting room? When you're in a hurry for something to happen and God isn't. That's God's waiting room. Some of you are in a hurry to graduate. Some of you are in a hurry to get married. Some of you are in a hurry to start a family. Some of you are in a hurry to launch a new business, to, to, to close a big deal. Some of you are in a hurry for a big goal, a big dream, a big accomplishment. Some of you are in a hurry for all kinds of, of different things and God isn't. And, and, and you're seeing the time getting shorter and shorter. You go, God, there ain't a whole lot of time left. This is either gonna happen or it's gonna not. God doesn't need a lot of time because he can do everything instantly, quickly. He's not, it's not like, well, I need two years to get this project done. He can do it. God can do more in a second than you can do in a year. You say, well, if, if God can do everything quickly, then why do I have delays in life? Well, God allows delays in your life for two reasons. Number one, to test your faith, will you trust him? And second, to build your character. To test your faith and to build your character. You see, while you're working on your project, your goal, your dream, your vision, God's working on you. And God's much more interested in you than in what you're trying to accomplish. Because you're not taking your accomplishments to he heaven, but you are taking your character. And sometimes God says, yeah, I intend to give you what I've promised you. I intend to answer that prayer. I intend to fulfill the vision, but you're not ready yet. You need to grow up. You need to man up and be a godly man. You need to be the woman, the strong woman that God intends for you to be. I want you to grow, and when you're ready, then it's gonna happen. A lot of times we think we're waiting on God for something to happen, like a prayer to be answered. God says, you're not waiting on me. I'm waiting on you. I'm trying to prepare you. I'm testing your faith, will you trust me? But I'm also trying to grow you up because the blessing I wanna give you is so much bigger than you can handle right now, you're not ready for it. You can't handle it yet. 
In Isaiah 49, verse eight, God says this, at the right time, there's that phrase again, that phrase is used about 96 times in the Bible, at the right time. At the right time, I will, not might, I will answer your prayers. Another thing you have to learn in life is that a delay is not a denial. There's a big difference between no and not yet. Now, immature children don't know the difference. You tell a kid, not yet, they start crying and having a hissy fit because they think it means no. They don't understand a delay is not a denial. God is saying, I I intend to do these things in your life that I've given you the vision, the dream to do, but you're just not ready yet. And at the right time, I will answer your prayer. God's often waiting on us. Now, why is this important? Because when you're in God's waiting room, you fall temptation to all kinds of negative emotions. When you're in a hurry for something to happen and it isn't happening yet, I wanna get married, I want a husband. Somebody who's sexy like Rick Warren. (laughs) Don't pray that, that would be a bad prayer. Uh, I'm in a hurry, God, I'm in a hurry. And God says, kind of cool your jets a minute. At the right time, the right place, my timing is perfect. But when there's a delay in your life, it can create all kinds of negative emotions. You start worrying. You start stressing out, you get anxious, you get irritable, you get spiritual ADD. You can get envious. You can get jealous. You go, hey, he got a promotion. I didn't get the promotion. She's having a baby. Well, I'm not having a baby. She got engaged. I didn't get engaged. He's starting a new business. It's taking off. What about mine? And, and, and all these kind of negative emotions can come into your life. And then you get frustrated and then you start having a pity party. So what does God want you to do when you're in the waiting room of life? And because you, you're gonna go through it many, many times. God is not a vending machine where you put in the prayer and then you pull the thing and you instantly get it. There's always a delay. The delays are by design. The delays are by design to teach you to trust him and to grow up in your character. So what does God want me to do while I'm waiting on God's timetable for what I wanna see happen in my life. You do four things. You do four things. And I wanna spend the rest of our time just looking at that. God gives us in the Bible four phrases. These are old English phrases from the King James Version of the Bible, and they are these. He says, fear not, fret not, forget not, and faint not. Fear not, fret not, forget not, and faint not. Let me explain these to you because this is what God wants you to do when things don't happen as fast or as slow as you want them to happen. Number one, write this down. Fear not, when things don't happen on your timetable, fear not means trust God. Fear not, to fear not means to trust God. The opposite of fear is faith. When you fill your life with faith, then you don't have the fear. Fear goes out the back door. And so when you, the more you trust God, the less you're gonna be afraid. The less you trust God, the more you're going to be afraid. In Mark 5, verse 36, Jesus says, don't be afraid, just trust me. Now this is such a big message in the Bible that it's there 365 times. The phrase, fear not, is in the Bible 365 times. God says, fear not, fear not, fear, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. 365 times, that's one for every day of the year. He's saying, I want you to get the message, I never want you to be afraid. You just need to trust my timing. Trusting God is the number one stress reliever in your life. And the more you trust God, the more your stress is gonna go down. The less you trust God, the more your stress is gonna go up. And so what you wanna do is pray a prayer like this, Psalm 31, verses 14 and 15. I trust you, Lord. I trust in you, Lord. You are my God and my times are in your hands. I would, have you ever prayed a prayer like that? You might wanna memorize that verse and pray it every morning. And you get up and go, I trust you, Lord, you're my God, my times are in your hands. What does that mean? 
God, I got more to do today than I got time to get done. I have so many appointments, there's no way I'll get it all done. Help me sort it all out, do what matters most and not worry about the rest. My times are in your hand. I surrender my schedule, I surrender my calendar, I surrender my agenda, my times are in your head. And that means I'm not gonna fear, I'm gonna trust you. Another, by the way, straight stress reliever is when you ask God for something in prayer, and the Bible says you can ask God for anything in prayer, but when you do, don't set the time limit on it. When you do, don't determine uh, the, the deadline, don't dictate the timing, leave the timing up to God. That'll lower your stress. Look at the next verse, Psalm 69, verse 13. I pray to you, Lord, so when the time is right, please answer me and help me with your wonderful love. What a great prayer. So say, God, I'm praying to you, and here's what I need, and you mention what you need. You need a new job, or you need, you need a raise, or whatever, whatever you need. I pray to you, Lord, and when the time is right, please answer me. And what you're saying is, I trust that you know better timing than me. I'm telling you what I need, but I'm not dictating the timing on it. That's trust. That's fearing not, but trusting God. Now the second thing you wanna do is fret not. And fret not, if you wanna write this down, means to be patient. To be patient and humble. To fret not means to be patient and humble. The word fret is an old English word that just means worry. And when you fret, you get all stressed out. You get anxious, you get irritable, you get worried, you fret, you fuss, you get all, you know, uh, you're in a bundle of nerves. It is, fretting is the opposite of patience. Fretting is impatient. When you fret, you are impatient. And, and, and we worry all the time, and we worry because things are either happening too fast, and that'll cause some people to worry. I can't handle this change, it's too fast. Or we worry because things are going too slow. Come on, God, speed it up. Can, can, can we get to where I wanna get? I'm asking you, I'm praying, I'm asking for all this. I don't know if you ever realize this, but waiting patiently on God is actually a statement of faith. You're complimenting God. When you wait patiently, you're going, God, I trust you, I have faith in you, I'm waiting on you, and I'm humble, I'm dependent upon you. See, we don't usually mind waiting if we can gripe about it. But God says, no, I don't want you to not only don't fear, don't fret. Don't gripe, don't get irritable. Um, the Bible says it like this in Psalm 37. Wait and trust the Lord. Don't fret. Don't fret when others prosper or when their dishonest plans succeed. And don't get angry or upset. It only leads to trouble. When you get fretting, it's gonna to lead to a lot of other negative emotions in your life. Now, I want you to circle, if you're taking notes, circle the word others. It says, don't fret when others prosper. What does that mean? It means you're looking at somebody else and that's causing you to worry. One of the big reasons you get stressed out is because you're constantly comparing yourself to other people. She just got a new job. I didn't. He's got a better lawn than we do. They got a new car. Every time you compare yourself to others, you're being foolish because you're one of a kind. You're not them, they're not you. God has a plan for your life and your plan for your life is different than their plan and if you're trying to be their plan, you're gonna miss the plan for your life. And, and, and so when you compare, the, those people are getting ahead, they're getting, that guy got the promotion, I didn't. And you start fretting. You start worrying. Now here's the problem. You know what the problem with worry is? It's totally worthless. Any second you spend in your life worrying, you've just wasted that second. Because worry can't do anything. Worry is worthless. Worry can't change the past, not gonna change the past. Worry can't control the future, not gonna control the future. All worry does is make today miserable. It is stewing without doing. It's like sitting in a rocket chair. You're going back and forth, back and forth. You're not making any progress. Wasting a lot of energy. Any second you're worrying, you're wasting energy. God says, don't fret. Don't, don't worry. 
Instead, just be patient and, and be humble. Look at this next verse. Philippians 4, 6. Don't fret or worry, God says. Instead of worrying, pray. Now, that is a good alternative because prayer can change things. Worry will never change anything, but prayer can change things. Don't fret or worry. Instead, worry, instead of worrying, pray. Let your petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. I love that. Shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. This last year was an incredibly frustrating year to me personally. As most of you know, I had a lot of health problems. Uh, I have a very rare disease that I've had for many, many years, at least 25 years. Been to Mayo Clinic and John Hopkins and UCLA doctors have all worked on me. And, and, and this year with the medicine I've been taking for 25 years stopped working. And I, I was ill much of this year. That meant that a lot of the things that I planned to get done on my agenda, on my list of stuff to accomplish, in this year, it didn't happen. Now, I could have gotten all frustrated by that. I could have been fearful and I could have been fretful. But I wasn't. I wasn't stressed out at all about it. Why? Because I'm one of those at the right time kind of followers of Jesus Christ. My times are in his hands. I'm not worried about it. And, and, and if, if all the stuff I plan to get done this year didn't get done, but I'm trusting God, he could get it all done in January of the next year in, a, in an instant. He can do more on his time than I can do in my timetable. So I didn't stress out about it. I didn't worry about it. I didn't fret about it. I just go, my time's in his hand. God knew before I was born that this particular year, I was gonna have a tough year with some chronic illness stuff. And so it didn't stress me out because my times are in his hands. You see, patience is actually related to humility. Look up here on the screen. The Bible says this, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand so that he can lift you up at just the right time. God looks out on earth looking for people who trust him, who will depend on him. That's called humility. God, I'm dependent on you instead of dependent on myself. And he goes, there's a woman who's humble. I'm gonna raise her up. I'm gonna lift her up. I'm gonna give her a new status. I'm gonna give her a better position, more prestige, more power. I'm gonna give her more influence because she humbles herself. I'm gonna lift her up. Let me, let me show you this verse in another translation. Look up here on the screen. In the message paraphrase. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. Don't act like you're somebody you're not. You know, just be authentic, be the real deal. God's strong hand is on you. And he'll promote you when? 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 At the right time. He will promote, you know what? That'll do a whole lot more than, a, than hiring a PR company. You don't need to go hire an image consultant, start marketing yourself and trying to get yourself, climb the ladder of success, because if you could climb the ladder, maybe leaning against the wrong wall. But if you are content, say, God, I'm just gonna trust you with this. I'm not gonna fear and I'm not gonna fret. But I'm gonna be patient and I'm gonna be humble. God says, that's the kind of person I like to give a promotion to. I could give you a hundred illustrations from my own personal life about that verse. That you don't, you don't have to know the key men in life if you know the man who holds the keys. And I know God, and he can do anything he wants to do. And he can open doors, close doors. I could give you so many illustrations of that. I don't have time to do it. So the Bible says fear not, and the Bible says fret not. Just relax and trust God and be patient. But the third thing God says is this, write it down, forget not. And what does that mean? He says, there's some things I don't want you to forget that while you're waiting, while you're in God's waiting room, you're waiting on me, to do the fulfillment of this dream. I want you to focus on what I've told you in my word. I don't want you to forget what I've already told you. So write this down. Forget not means study God's promises. Study God's promises. This book, the Bible, is God's word to you. Did you know that in this book, there are over 6,000 promises of God to you? Can you name one of them? Can you name a single promise of God to you? If you can't even name it, how in the world can you claim it? 
How can you take advantage of it? It's kind of like this. If I've got an insurance policy and I don't know what it covers and I'm in an accident, I am going to fear, be fearful and I am going to be fretful and I'm going to stress out because I'm going to go, oh man, I got to pay for all this. But if on the other hand, I know what the insurance company has promised to cover, I get in an accident, I go, I'm not worried about that. The insurance company's covered it. This is the policy on your life. And if you don't ever read it, you don't know what God's promised to do in your life. No wonder you're stressed out. No wonder you're worried because you don't know what God has offered to do if you'll trust him. So the third thing you gotta do is forget not, and that means you need to go study this book. There's over 6,000 promises, as I said. Let me show you a couple verses. The book of James, chapter one in the Bible says this, verse 25. If you keep looking closely into God's perfect word, that's the Bible, that sets people free. Jesus said the truth will set you free. And you keep studying it and you don't forget it and you put it into daily practice, you will be blessed by God in some of what you do. Oh, that's not what it says. It says, if you do those things, you'll be blessed by God in what? All All you do. You might circle that word. I I, I just had to check that out for myself. The Bible is written in the New Testament, written in Greek. Uh, I've had six years of Greek. I went and I back and looked up that word. You know the word in Greek, all, it means all. (laughs) He says, I'll bless you in every single area of your life. What does he say? If you look at Closely at my word, that means you, you read a little bit of this book every day. That's looking closely. And then he says, and then you study it. That means you write some stuff down. The difference between reading and studying is you use a pencil. You go, oh, that's a good verse. I need to write that down. Now you've gone from reading to studying. And then he says, and then you remember it. That means you memorize it. Have you ever memorized a single verse of the Bible? Because if you haven't, God can't call them to memory when you're stressed out. He, it, those promises, you don't even remember. You go, I know it's somewhere in there. There's a promise about this. But if you've memorized it, God can bring it to mind. Go, oh man, my stress just went down. And so a thousand other uses too. And then he says, and then you put it into action. You will be blessed by God in all you do. So friends, this next year, you got a choice. You want to be stressed? Or you want to be blessed? It's your choice. God says, you get to choose. You wanna be stressed, you be blessed. What's the key to being blessed? You read, you study, you remember, and you do what this says. And he says, the more you do it, the more you're gonna be blessed in all you do. This Christmas, as your pastor, as your spiritual coach, I wanna give you a Christmas gift that'll last, last you the rest of your life. This is the best possible gift you get is the promise that everything else you do in life, you will succeed at doing. You say, you gotta be kidding me. No, and not only that, you'll be happy too. You say, what's that promise? We'll look at the next verse. You wanna be happy, you wanna be successful? Here's what the Bible says, Psalm chapter one, verses one to three. Happy are those who find joy in obeying the word of God, the word of the Lord, and they study it day and night. In other words, so they can follow it. They are like trees that grow strong beside a stream and they bear fruit at the right time. What does that mean? You're gonna be productive. Your life will be productive. You will bear fruit in your life at the right time. Your life will be productive. Your life will be meaningful. Your life will be significant if you're you're obeying the word of God. He says you'll be like a... A tree by the river, you know, you're not drying up. In other words, you don't, you don't flake out, you don't blow away. It says they will succeed in everything they do. Now, friends, either that verse is true or God is a flat-out liar. You gotta just decide, am I gonna believe what God says or am I just gonna doubt it? And if you don't believe that verse, you ought to take an exacto knife and cut it out of your Bible and throw it away. He says, you will succeed in everything you do if you'll do it my way. Let me recommend to you 
that you trust, not your feelings, but you trust what God says because eternity is a long time to be wrong. It's like you're wrong for the rest of eternity. Oh, fear not, fret not, forget not. And then God says, there's one other thing I want you to do when my timetable is different than your timetable, when you're in the waiting room of life, when things are delayed or things are too fast or too slow and you're not, you're stressed out by it. He says, fear not. And he says, forget not. And he says, you know, um, fret not. And then he says, faint not. Now that's an old English phrase. Comes out of the King James Version of the Bible, faint not. It means don't quit. It means don't give up. It means keep on keeping on, be determined, be diligent, uh, have endurance. And he says, just because things don't happen right away, keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Look at this verse, Galatians chapter six, verse five. We must never get tired of doing what is right and doing what is good. For at the right time, there's that phrase again, God's timing, at the right time, that's God's time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up or quit. Question. This Christmas, what are you feeling like giving up on? I mean, if if you're really gut level honest, if you let us crawl inside your mind, what what do you feel like giving up on? Some of you feel like giving up on your marriage, if the truth is told. It's it's dead and going nowhere. I can't get on with it, I can't get out of it. I feel like giving up on your marriage. Some of you feel like giving up on your career. I have tried and tried and tried, it just didn't happen. Some of you feel like giving up on your dream. Some of you feel like giving up on your kids or a friend or a goal. Some of you feel like giving up on yourself. You've thought about taking your life. And I want you to know that a thousand years before you were born, God knew that you would be sitting in Saddleback Church on Christmas Eve uh, or Christmas week this year so God could have me say this to you as your spiritual coach, don't, 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 don't you dare. The light is at the end of the tunnel. You may be just around the corner. Don't, don't give up. Now is the time, he says, we must never get tired for at the right time we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Don't give up. Look up. Look up, look up to God. Now you're gonna need a spiritual family, that's called a church, to help you through the tough times of your life. There's gonna be a lot of times in your life you feel like giving up. I'm so glad I didn't give up on God, but I'm also glad that God didn't give up on me so many times in my life. You need a family. Now I wanna close by talking to you about two times in your life where God says, It's always the right time to do this. We can't say this about a lot of stuff, but there are two things in life that God says, it is always the right time to do these two things. And the first one is, it is always the right time to come back home to God. It's always the right time to come back home to God. Look at what the Bible says, Acts chapter three, verse 19. Now, now is the time to change your ways and come back to God so he can wipe away your sins and pour out showers of blessing to refresh you. You need a little refreshment in your life? You feeling a little dried up? You feeling like there's no no fresh refreshment in my life? I need some renewal, I need some revival, I need some refreshment in my life. Come back to God. Come back to, you say, Rick, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know. I don't have to know, I don't care to know, why? Because it doesn't matter who, who you are or what you've done or who you've done it with or how long you've done it, God says, I still want you to come back to me. You say, well, isn't God gonna like scold me? I, I've been away from God for months or years or decades. Look at the next verse. The Bible says this. Here's what God will do if you come back to him. God says, with deep love, 
I will take you back. With deep love, I will take you back. No matter what's happened, with deep love, I will take you back. We started this service talking about love came down. God is love. With deep love, I will take you back. You see, God isn't mad at you. God is mad about you. No one will ever love you more than the creator who made you. God, the Father, created you. Jesus, the Son, died for you. God's Spirit wants to live in you. No one will ever love you more. With deep love, I will take you back. But you know what? As a pastor, and as talked, as I said, to thousands of people, I know that some people just can't feel God's love. And I've thought about it a lot. Why is it that they can't feel God's love? Because I feel God's love all the time. Why can't they feel God's love? And I've discovered it's because they're listening to different voices. Now, if you listen to what other people say about you, you're gonna get down. Uh, if, if you listen to what you tell yourself, you're gonna get down. I wanna give you permission to stop believing everything you tell yourself, because it's not true. You lie to yourself more than you lie to anybody else. I'll say it again. You lie to yourself more than you lie to anybody else. You tell yourself things are better than they really are when they're not. And sometimes you tell yourself they're worse off. They're not as bad as you say they are. You're not a really of that good a judge of you. Feelings lie. You may have just eaten a bad burrito. <laughs> now you may be in God's waiting room and you're still waiting for something to happen that just hadn't happened. You've dreamed of it, but it hasn't happened yet. But I told you there are two things it's always the right time for. Number one, it's always the right time to come home to God, no matter how far you've drifted away. The second thing it's always the right time for is to accept the saving grace of Jesus Christ, which is why he came at Christmas and died on the cross and rose again on Easter. It's always the right time to accept the saving grace of Jesus. Once you understand it, it would be foolish to procrastinate the very thing you need to live for eternity and to be reconnected to the God who made you. So you do it like right now. I mean, right now. Look at the last two verses, what the Bible says about receiving the grace of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter two, the verse six in the Bible says this. God, Jesus gave himself to pay for the sins of everyone. That means me, that means you. We're included in the everyone. Did you realize, do you know that all the things you've ever done wrong have already been paid for? Even the sins you haven't even committed yet, like the ones next year and in the next 10 years and in 20 years, every one of your sins have already been paid for. Maybe you don't know that. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. Jesus himself gave himself to pay for the sins of everyone. He is the proof that God wants all of us to be saved. All of us. I don't care if you're Buddhist or Baptist or Hindu or Methodist or Muslim or Mormon or Catholic or Jew or atheist, or agnostic, or no religion at all. I don't care anything. The Bible says he wants, God wants all of us to be saved. Doesn't matter what your religious or ethnic or financial background is, he says he wants all of us to be saved. And that proof came at the right time. At the right time. That's what Christmas is all about. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter six. God says this to you. This hour is the right time. This hour is the right time to receive my grace. This is the day of salvation. The day of salvation is now. Today I'm ready to save you. I mean like, like right now. I have had the privilege of helping tens of thousands of people step across that spiritual line. It would be my honor and my humble privilege to help you do that right now. So let's bow our heads. 
I'm gonna pray for you as a pastor. And then I'm gonna invite you to pray with me to God a prayer of salvation. (sighs) Father, uh, this issue of time and timing and delays and rushing uh, really creates stress and anxiety in our lives, especially when we forget how much you love us. And it creates enormous pressure when we forget how that you know what's best for us. You know us better than we even know ourselves because you made us. And, and we forget about how you've taken care of us in the past, even when we totally ignored you. You're a good God. Father, today there are a lot of people here that I care about uh, who are waiting for something to happen in their lives and it hasn't happened yet. And I pray that today, that each of us will come back to you, will receive your grace, will begin to trust you for the timing, the right timing uh, in our lives. I, I, I want all of these people, everybody in our church family and all of our guests that we're so happy to have here tonight, I want every one of these people to be blessed, not stressed, in the new year. Now, now you pray. You say, what do I say? It doesn't matter what you say. What matters is not the words, but an attitude of humility. Just tell God you need him. Be humble. You say, I really don't know what to pray. Okay, I'll, I'll pray a prayer. And as I pray this prayer, you can say, uh, me too, God. What Rick's saying, that's, that's, that's me. That represents my heart, okay? Just say something like this. God, I admit that I often get stressed by the timing of things in my life. I don't like to be rushed and and I don't like delays. And there's some things in my life that just move way too slow. And there are some other things in my life that would move way too fast. And God, I need your help to stop fearing and fretting and forgetting and feeling like giving up. Would you please forgive me for all the times I've impatiently rushed ahead because I was in a hurry and I made a dumb decision. And would you forgive me for all the times that I've tried to control the situation and I've even tried to control other people. I'm sorry. I wanna learn to relax. God, I I wanna learn to relax and trust your perfect timing Help me to remember that you're never late, that I don't have to run ahead of you, that you're always on time, that your timing is perfect, that you can do more at the right time than I could ever do on my own effort in an entire lifetime. Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming to save me at the right time. Thanks for Christmas. I wanna come back home to God and I want to receive your saving grace. So please, please, save me. I don't even understand it all, but I'm asking you to save me. Save me from myself. There are things about me I don't like, but I just can't change. Save me from my sins. Save me from my mistakes. God, save me from my stress. Save me from my sadness, my loneliness, and all the other things, the worries and the shame or guilt and anxieties. Just, I need salvation in every area of my life. Thank you that you want to save me. I want to learn to trust you every day and trust your timing. And I wanna live in your love and peace for the rest of my life. I humbly ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I wanna invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. 
First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking Class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.